Our guests today are Sergia Popovich and Tina Rosenberg. Sergia is the author of a wonderfully entertaining book entitled Blueprint for Revolution, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Man, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, or Simply Change the World. Interviewing Sergia about his book and his work will be New York Times journalist Tina Rosenberg, author of the widely acclaimed The Haunted Land, Facing Europe's Ghosts After Communism, for which she won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award for Nonfiction. You are a student at Belgrade University in 1998 in the midst of a dictatorship that has just started its fourth war. And you are meeting with 10 other students in a cafe, lots of cigarette smoking, and you decide, let's overthrow this guy. That's insane. How did you do it? <laughs> it's a great question. And I think it's a great story. And I think the story of Serbian students as a political nobodies and a little hobbit who undertake the strange struggle to overthrow one of the worst Balkan dictators is really inspiring. And it's, uh, it was a partly a lunacy. It was partly a necessity. Because up to 1998, we were already engaged for years. We started when in our early 20s when we gave up our rock life and it turned up into our kind of the activist life. And it was necessity. The guy was just there. And he was just destroying the, everything that we were taking for a common sense. It was getting country in a war. It was bringing dictatorship. It was bringing the worst junk culture. And every single thing which is unethical was kind of blossoming in that country. So within the situation, you had two, two different, uh, uh, different options. You could fight or you could flee. 100,000 people, including my elder brother, they, they just fled the country. But some of us, they, we stayed and fight. And yes, it was not the most, uh, uh, we were not the best equipped. But then, like any other hobbits, we didn't wear the shiny armor, so didn't have the big magic. But we have some, some skills. We had the heart to do stuff. We knew how to mobilize the people. We understood a certain level of creativity. And in 1998, we already had a tremendous experience of doing it. 992 in universities, 996, 97, throughout the 100 days of demonstrations. So in our late 20s, in a very weird way, we were kind of nonviolent struggle veterans. So you were not newbies when you started in 1998. You'd already been involved in the struggle for since 91, I think, and had learned a lot. But you said you knew how to mobilize people. That's, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So what did Atpour do to mobilize people? And how was Atpour different than other political movements in Serbia? Why did you succeed where others did not at mobilizing people? Well, first of all, we understood that you need to build the different alliances. You need mm -hmm. to reach to the people who are not alike you, mm -hmm. clever urban intellectuals. You need to really look at where the numbers are. And numbers, unfortunately, in Serbia, but more or less in any other countries, are not only in urban intellectual circles. Mm -hmm. The numbers are in what you American called rednecks, very often people who live in the villages. So this is the first thing we understood. We need to build numbers where they are. And we need to build a vision of tomorrow. The part of the book is like, dream big, start small. So now we, we, once we start dreaming big, we were starting small. So we were starting with graffiti. Very often the groups have a big stamina to start with the big stuff. But what really works in nonviolent struggle is that you, know, you want to do achievable things. Because you know, people will sit on the fence till they see you are kind of successful. Mm -hmm. So if you start with a little prank, with a little graffiti, you don't really aim, let's make a climate change march and bring 400,000 people. That comes at the end. But if you gradually build these numbers, then people will join in. Last but not of least importance, don't try to be too serious. Serbs are not the serious people. We love jokes. We grew up listening to the Monty Python's Flying Circus. And one of the things in this book, which is kind of funny as well, is catching the moment of creativity. How this thing really works? How do you really challenge evil and fear with humor and creativity? Give, give me an example. We started with the famous, famous anecdote of Barrel. We were like 20 people. So you know we would paint Milosevic's picture. Well, Serbs are not politically correct at all. So you need to understand this. So we would paint the Milosevic picture and make it as a flipper. So people will put the coin in and have a right to hit the barrel. 
we put the barrel in the Serbian version of Fife Avenue, which is the main downtown shopping district. So within the range of 15 minutes, you have people waiting in line to really show their respect for their ruler. And where are you in this? We were withdrawn to the reserve position, smoking cigarettes and drinking, <laughs> drinking uh, coffee in, in a bar, so watching the, the barrel the was sitting yes. out there by itself. And the barrel was there, the people were having fun, the ki kids were kicking the barrel. You know, kids love this type of fun. And that was not the funny moment. The funny moment was when police arrived. Mm. And what they will do? They will arrest the downtown shoppers. It doesn't really work. And charge them with what? They will arrest us while we are not there. Well, they arrested the barrel. So the photograph, you know, the photojournalists, they were super happy. The photograph of police arresting the barrel with Milosevic face, dragging it to the police station. You know, you, you are a journalist. You, you would use this opportunity yes. to really, you know, publish it. Why? Uh, these small acts of resistance, why is humor so powerful? Why? Well, there are several reasons for this. I mean, first of all, I think it's when you look at the status quo in the society, the status quo is either fear or apathy. You want to look at the dictatorships? It's fear. You want to look at the corrupt democracies? You know, people are too busy buying in Walmarts. That's what American activists will tell you. And uh, how do you break it? You break it very much lovely with a humor. Imagine the situation you need to go to the major surgery. The last thing you want to hear is the procedure. You know, they are going to open your chest, they're going to do this. No, 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 no. But if, you know, your husband or your family member or friend cracks a joke, immediately the fear disappears. Mm. Second very important thing is, you know, very much the book tells a story that the movements are very much the things like from your life. So if you're a person standing for values in your life, if you're an ethical person in your life, if you're a funny person in your life, you can build a, a funny movement. And when you look in your own environment, who is the most popular person around you? The richest one, the tallest one, the biggest one, the most educated one, or the one who can make you laugh? Mm. So laughter is the natural center of gravity for the people, and that adds the cool factor. And a lot of these movements, not only Serbian movement, but when you look throughout the world, the successful movements were cool. People wanted to go there. And then last very important thing about the humor is when you're challenging people in power, you will realize that they take themselves too often too seriously. Where democratically elected or dictators, they watch too much of themselves on the TV, in the billboards, in the newspapers, and they start believing this big image. So if there is a little people pranking them, you know, with a petrol barrel, there's also a great story about, you know, toy protests in Russia, you know, you have a ruler who spends millions in PR, who poses shirtless, restless tigers, saves dolphins from drowning. I mean, Putin is the master of being, you know, the guy. And now you have a little group of people in 2012 who are protesting disputed election in Barnaul, Siberia. It's a small place, protests are not allowed, so people build their little legal town. And they come with the little toys who are carrying protests like 130% votes for Putin. You know, give us our vote back. And the first day, everybody has fun, everybody's taping, it went viral, and then what really happens is that somebody sees this in Kremlin, and they understand the very nature. If they react, they will regret. If they don't react, people will think, oh, we can do this at home. So, you know, let's make a little toy protest everywhere. So the phone, phone, phone rings of the, of the chief police station in Barnaul, he gets a call, and he needs to take the press conference, and he needs to stand in front of the camera, and say that the protest of 100 toy soldiers, 50 kinder toy, and you know, 50 toy cars is banned because toys are not citizens of Russia. And now we are having the shirtless guy wrestling tigers being afraid of little toys. So this is the power of creativity. It's not expensive, it takes a little bit of creativity. It's basically low risk because, I mean, what, they will sentence you for organizing a toy protest. That's not the case. Sergio, that's a great story, and it's, it's easy to understand how this embarrassed um, the, the authorities, but what happened with it? I mean, how do you go from these, these cute, funny little pranks to having a wider impact? Every single movement is different, and there is no copy-paste of this kind of struggle because the consequences are different, but if, you need to follow the rules. And one of the rules you need to follow, you need to build the unity. So aside of these little pranking tactics, making movement cool, and in, you really need numbers. Numbers are never on the fringe. So, you know, you remember the environmental movement starting as a groups of people tying themselves for defense of the nukes, but it became really big where it involved people who are less radical and more realistic, and there was a scientific research. So you need to build Move from your spectrum, yes, towards the center. The numbers are never on the fringe, 
Effective non-malignant movements operate well only when they have numbers. The numbers are always on the center. You need to compromise with these people. That's the hard part. Yes, it's super cool being right and being surrounded with the cool people who think around you. But if you really want to change the society, it's not enough to be right. You need to listen. I, I had the marvelous class with NYU students, tremendous, clever young men and women. And we were discussing Black Lives Matter campaign and what can be done to make it more mainstream and involve more people in it. And because they go through the part of the training we give to the activists on the class, they came out with a very good results, and they're looking at the social distance. You're looking at the black population, and you're looking at the white police, which has a kind of the, you know, perception of being invaders, mm -hmm. occupiers of the place. So the cause of the problem is how you bridge this social distance. Because if it's us and them, there will never be a social change. You know, you need to, to work to build across this bridge. And there is a great sentence of my political mentor and a great friend, uh, late Prime Minister of Serbia, Zoran Djindic, he, he captured it in a sentence, we will start winning when we understand that the police man is a man in a police uniform. So it's not an enemy, it's not a something you would whistle, it's not something you would throw stone at, it's somebody who shares dreams, it's somebody with a family. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's universally acknowledged that nonviolent struggle is the moral choice, it's the ethical choice, not everybody would agree with you that it's the more effective choice. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, the beauty of this job is that you always learn. We, are, we, we have witnessed fantastic holographic protests in Spain like last week or underwater protests in Maldives. But the consequences are different and there is no copy-paste. However, there are certain rules you, you, can, you can observe and you can look at these, at these kind of struggle. Uh, first one, it's unity. You need to build a unity. And whatever is the unity is most difficult for you to reach. If it's the religious unity in Syria mm -hmm. between the Kurds and Alawites, and you know, it's like, it's that part of unity. And it was the political unity, of course. We say two Serbs, three political parties, four football clubs. This is our <laughs> mentality. So it's like the, but we bring together 19 opposition parties together. And whenever you don't see human. this unity, then, then, then you can see that the, the movement is winning. What is, what is really kind of interesting is that, you know, it's like throughout these years, we understood that there is no universal way of changing things, but there are certain rules you need to follow. And we try to distill these rules. You know, one of the things that uh, people often say, it's like Gandhi won because he was nonviolent. Gandhi won because he was a great strategist. And you want to imbed nonviolence as a part of your movement. It is A, more moral, it is B, more ethical, but there is a studies which show that it is also more likely to succeed. So there is this fantastic study by Maria Stefan and Erika Chenoweth, two, two American scholars, which examines 323 different campaigns in 106 years, really serious scientific research. I don't pretend being a scientist, but they are. So this study shows that the nonviolent struggles are twice more likely to succeed. Plus, they are twice more likely to succeed within the half time. So the very idea that the violence is faster, it's, you know, this is something which doesn't work. Well, that brings us to explanation, how do you maintain nonviolent discipline? We try to learn throughout these years that nonviolent discipline is a skill. And skills can be taught and learned. So you can preach it as an ideology, you can train your people to sit in front of the police rather than throw stones, and of course you can identify potentially violent parts of the society that will join black bloc type of people and you know disaffiliate your movement from these people. You've said that when you do workshops for other, um, for democracy activists in other countries, almost always one of the first questions you get is, this might have worked in Serbia, this will never happen. But it would not work here. Our guy is too violent. You can't just ask somebody to step down. What is your response to that? Well, I mean, it's like the response is that they are basically right in terms that every single struggle is different. So you can't really take the Serbian struggle and copy paste it to somewhere, or you can't really take the Tunisian struggle and copy paste it to Egypt. The conditions are different. The mentalities are different. There is one thing that they are, of course, right. But you, you want to look at the certain elements of success and you want to look at the movements in the past and you want to look at the case study of the movements which really changed the world. And you want to look at the Gandhi, you want to look at the Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. So all of these movements have things in common. So instead of telling people or persuading them this, this, this can work, 
you try to really change their point of view. I had a great opportunity to speak with some North Koreans recently, deflected North Koreans in Seoul, and this is probably one of the most closed societies in the world. Well, still people are looking where is the political space. And of course, they can't go and protest because they will end up in concentration camp or worse, but they are looking at these little things like regime is not delivering, the streets are dirty, nobody carries out the garbage, there is no public transportation. Every single of these points can become the point for gathering. And this is where people build horizontal relationship. This is where they build this sense of community. So you focus on it on an ostensibly non-political goal. Very often. To help you build your movement and Very often. build confidence. Because A, you build the small victories. B, you build confidence. C, you make this link. There's this fantastic one. Once again, this is the, this is the story in, in, in Russia, in Yekaterinburg. There was this corrupt... I don't know, mayor or governor, somebody who was not paving the streets, and there were potholes everywhere. So what people have done during one night, they were portraying the face of their mayor around the potholes. So, you know, when you come there with a car and you hit the pothole, of course you curse. But it becomes personal now. And this is where you understand that this is not only loftivism. This is making people understand that it is their taxes paying their officials mm -hmm. to, fix their, to fix their potholes. So this non-delivery and keeping politicians accountable may sound very, as a very small success for somebody who lives in democracy, but in autocratic society, it's all the difference between you know, uh, very obedient citizens and what they consider national awakening. Because once they understand that they are paying their officials and these officials are not delivering, then you know, they may ask for delivery and that may become very difficult for these governments to cope with. Talk about um, tactics of dispersal. It's a great point. It's like one of the things, one of the main reasons we wrote this book for is because I hate people having this wrong picture of what nonviolent struggle is. When you say nonviolent struggle, people say protests, marches, March. million of people, occupy this, occupy that. Mm -hmm. We call this tactics of concentration. You concentrate either your people or your time or your resources in one spot looks great on the TV, which is probably the reason everybody thinks that this is what the nonviolent struggle is all about. But you've lived in Chile, so you know what would happen to Chileans when they go to demonstrate against Pinochet. They would shut dead, that's a clear thing, arrest, something really nasty. When you are prevented from going to the square, what would you do? Would you insist on going and getting in conflict with the police, or you would disperse. So there's, we call this small acts of resistance or low risk tactics of dispersion. So Chileans would go home and hit pots and pans from windows. We were doing this as well. And they would turn the lights on and off. The beauty of it is A, anybody can do it. B, they will arrest you for what? For banging pots and pans from your own home. It's unlikely. Successful nonviolent movements know how to engage young people, rural people, clever people, stupid people, old people, like the pensioners could do it, like my grandma was hitting pot and pan. And you know, Chileans were even more clever. They were developing this fantastic moment of driving half speed and walking half speed. It started with taxi drivers and then you know, continued with the people. And immediately everybody was doing something which is A, subversive, and B, completely legal. Because even in North Korea, there is no traffic sign which says you must drive faster than seven miles an hour. <laughs> oh, you, you must drive slower than 30 miles and that's it. But what if you drive two miles and I drive two miles and she drives two miles, so, you know, we collapse the whole city and everybody's honking and immediately, there's a fantastic sentence I, I, I've seen in one of the movies about the chiller. There is the guy who says, okay, the main thing was that this blurb of fear just disappeared at the moment because we understand that we are the many mm -hmm. and they that's are the few. Point. Yep. And that's like, you know, the power in numbers, it also build this kind of stuff. And these small acts of resistance is what we should focus on and what we should explain. It's unfortunately, they're not so media sexy, so they don't right. get so much attention as a big thing. But then one of the reasons why, why, why I think this book matters now is because we are witnessing the occupyism. It's, it's the trend in the world which has nothing to do with the fair goals of Occupy movement. It has to do with copying the Tahrir strategy. Mm -hmm. So Tahrir was bring people in one place, Occupy was bring people on one place, Hong Kong now bring people on one place. Problem with high risk tactics of concentration is A, it's demanding. People need food, people need to sleep, people need toilets, and how the square will look after seven days. 
How will you keep people busy and happy after seven days? And it's highly ineffective in the terms that your opponent, like mainly in China, only need to sit and wait for numbers to dwindle. Mm -hmm. And you're wasting the large resources. Part of the things we do in our workshops and in our classes is we do cost-benefit analysis. Like 10,000 people sitting on a square for three hours listening to this stupid speaker. This is 30,000 working hours. What else? How many doors can we knock? How many pots and pans we can ban? And it's like the, these low risk tactics of dispersion, they were everywhere, but people just don't look at it. And they are so much better designed for highly oppressive societies because you're less likely to, to get arrested or worse. There was an article, which I'm sure you're aware of, years ago in the New York Times and the Sunday Magazine about Otpor. And um, what it specifically talked about is the structure of Otpor. Mm -hmm. which was largely based on the Palestinians and this idea of resistance and not necessarily having one central leader, but that mm -hmm. the leadership structure is, is very decentralized. So if you could talk a little bit about that. First, uh, decentralization was a necessity. And it, was, uh, it came from necessity. First, the Serbian 90s were so disappointed in opposition leaders that we understood that you know, having charismatic leaders was not a good idea. Plus, leaders are vulnerable. You know, you can put them in jail like Nelson Mandela or Aung San Suu Kyi, or you can kill them. You know, what Pinochet was doing to the opposition <coughs> leaders was throwing them from the plane. This decentralization kind of did several great things for us. First, we were gathered around the symbol of the clenched fist. And I think the, the book tells an important story why these elements of group identity really matters. And this is, of course, values first, but also symbols and the type of music and the type of culture. So what is this shared culture you have in the movement? Because this is the glue that keeps you together, even if they arrest people. And I think decentralized system was really helpful. And it brought us to the fantastic situation where we have internal competition, like the local branches did their own thing. And while they were sticking to the message and staying nonviolent, they were free to do whatever type of activities they would do, and they ended up getting the crazier, the more powerful, the more pranky thing, getting more people arrested. You know, there were internal competition. It was also hell on earth for the government because we couldn't predict what our local branches would do. And of course they couldn't predict. So it's like, it's a really good way to keep your, your opponent off guard. Can you give us some thoughts on the social media? Is it effective? Is it ineffective? When does it work and how? When does it not work and why doesn't it work? We are living in a city where the biggest expert and enthusiast of the social media uh, uh, and the political movements lives. Uh, his name is Clay Shirky and he's far more qualified to speak about it. But I'll try to look at three things which are good and three things which are bad. Let's start for good. New media makes organizing faster, cheaper, less risky. Like 10 years ago, you need to do leaflets, knock doors, go posters. Now you make a Facebook group, everybody is there. B, I had a dinner last night with a wonderful woman, Yvette, who runs the organization called Witness. New media brought a fantastic price tag to every state sponsor violent and human rights violations everywhere in the world. Because when you look at demonstrations in the lowest tech place in the world like Bahrain, somebody's taping. And you make sure that if there is a violence, you know, it will go viral very fast. Last but not the least importance, what we are passionate about, new media brought a whole new world of learning. And this is not only downloading e-books. This is now groups teaching how to do tactics from each other. This is group being inspired by viral videos. This is group, you know, we are in the process of conquering the technique. Like last year through Harvard, we did a workshop on nonviolent tactics. 200 people, 63 different countries. You, you can't imagine the cost of it, as you can't imagine the risk of smuggling 17,000 physical books on how to organize the popular movement in Iran. It was not possible before the new media. However, new media have some downsides as well. First of them I'll call clicktivism. You know, how many polar bears have you saved by clicking on a Facebook page? Not too many. But you still do it. And the problem is that very often you get seduced by the power of the online world, but the change is really done in the real world. 
And I think the organizations are really figuring this out. I had a great meeting with the leader of Avaz, Rikin Patel, who is one of the most intelligent persons I've met. These are the people behind this tremendous climate change march. They, for the first time, say, we have such a huge online following. Let's go offline. Let's do something on the Mother Earth to see if this power of clicks has sometimes be translated down. Second downside of the, of the new media, dictators learn. Putin has an army of people who, who, who are called bots, like robots, the people who post nasty comments under the opposition. Last but not of least importance, uh, there is the danger in assembling people easily. And we've seen this last year in Bosnia, for example, and in many other places. You need to understand that reaching numbers too fast before you're ready, it's equally dangerous as not reaching numbers at all. Last year, we were witnessing tremendous, I mean, Boston is a small country. So when you have 10,000 people there, it's like a million people here. So it's a really small country. Tens of thousands of angry people protesting because somebody called them over the Facebook. No organization, no nonviolent discipline. It ended up by burning several governmental buildings, a lot of injured people. No clear demands, great disappointment. Yes, new media are fantastic in bringing people together and, and putting a price tag in violence, and especially learning, but we need to understand that this is a tool and this is not the substance. Substance is happening in a real world. Well, Sergia and Tina, I want to thank you both for giving us a wonderful discussion. And Sergia, if anyone could lead a revolution and have followers, you'd be the one, certainly. So I thank you for joining us. And thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.